read the Word of God tonight once again from Habakkuk chapter 1. The text tonight is verses 5 through 11. I ask that you pay special attention to those verses as we read from Scripture tonight. I won't reread those verses 5 through 11. We'll read Habakkuk chapter 1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible, dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards, and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind. They shall gather the captivity as the sand. They shall scoff at the kings and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend imputing this his power unto his God. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? And makest men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the angle, they catch them in their net, and gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice unto their net, and burn incense unto their drag. Because by them their portion is fat, and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net, and not spare continually to slay the nations? And thus far we read the word of God tonight. I call your attention to those verses 5 through 11. In the text that we consider tonight, beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can see once again why this prophecy of Habakkuk is a burden. A burden of the Lord placed upon the prophet. That refers to the fact that for the prophet, this is not an easy word for him to speak and to bring on behalf of God. And that this is a burden refers to the fact that this is not a pleasant or an easy word for those who hear this word to listen to. We saw that in verses 2 through 4. If the Lord, when He called the man to be a prophet, asked the prophet, what word would you like me to commission you to bring to my people? The prophet would probably say, give me a pleasant word a comfort, comforting word to bring to the people. 
But the Lord doesn't ask that of the prophet. The Lord says to the prophet, I send you with my word, and this is the word I send you to bring. And in verses 2 through 4, it's a word of sin. And it's not a word where God says to the prophet, warn the people, tell the people, avoid this, stay away from this sin. But it is the burden of the prophet that is like when a parent has to sit down with the child and say not to the child, now I'm going to warn you about certain sins, stay away from them. But the parent has to say to the child, you've sinned, you're guilty, you've done this. That's the burden that the Lord placed upon Habakkuk in those first four verses. Go to the people of Judah and say, thou art the people. You are the ones who are guilty of violence. You're guilty of hatred towards the neighbor, of taking advantage of the neighbor. And you're guilty you rulers and you people of perverting justice and departing from the law of the Lord. Now the Lord showed all of that iniquity to the prophet Habakkuk and the prophet was burdened, we saw last time, grieved because as he looked over the nation of Judah, he didn't see anyone who appeared to care about this situation, anyone who appeared to be willing to do anything about this state of iniquity in the land of of Judah. So the prophet cried to Jehovah. And then he was grieved after that too. For it appeared to him that he cried and the Lord did nothing to save. He cried and the Lord did nothing to bring judgment. It appeared that Jehovah God didn't care. But now in verse 5 of the text, we see that the response of God is to explain to the prophet. You think I don't see? You think that I don't care? Behold. And he says here, look among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously. That is, look among the heathen and be astonished and be astounded. And the Lord says, for I will work a work in your days. And then in verse 6, the Lord says, not only I will, but He says, I am doing something. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. God answers the prophet with a word of judgment. And that too now becomes a burden for the prophet. This is not a pleasant word. Again, it's not a warning. The prophet is not sent by God to say to the people, now you're under probation. And the Lord is giving you a warning and saying to you, consider your ways and repent. And in the way of repentance, the Lord will lift the judgment. No, this is a word about judgment that has already started and judgment that will come. And it is a word of severe and harsh judgment. This is not, and I'll explain that in the course of the sermon, the main reason for why this is an astonishing judgment. But this is in part the reason why this is astonishing. Judgment is going to fall upon the Judah of God, upon the church. And when that judgment falls, one might think God will go easy. He will use kid gloves when judgment falls in Judah. But no, the Lord says, you think my judgment will be harsh and severe upon such people as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the people of Egypt and the people of Babylon and the wicked in the United States and the wicked in a city such as Las Vegas and you think that when my judgment falls in Judah and the church, that that judgment won't be harsh and severe? Behold, be astounded and astonished. The Word of God here speaks of harsh judgment that falls upon Judah. And this is a word that is much needed in the church today. 
In a day when in the church sin is not dealt with as sin, it is not condemned, and all of the talk is about love, we, needed, we need to be reminded that this is a word of judgment that must be brought to Judah, to the church. This is the word that elders must bring in the church. That God is righteous and that He hates sin. That sin is to be condemned. This is the word that parents in the church are to bring to their children. A word of judgment. Condemnation of sin. And if that doesn't happen, if the church will not condemn sin, this is a word that reminds us God will not be mocked. He will bring judgment. But this is too, and as we listen to this word of God tonight, we need to see that this is a word of love and encouragement. We must not fall into the error that many fall into today, separating judgment and discipline from love. God does not do that. And as we hear this Word of God tonight, we ought to be reminded of what God says in Proverbs 19, verse 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. That's God's commandment, and that's also God's own way. He chastens his son. In Hebrews 12, verse 6, we must remember too. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. With that in mind then, let's consider this word of God under the theme, the shocking judgment of Judah. That's what we have here, the astonishing judgment of Judah. Let's notice in the first place the dreadful and from a certain point of view, shocking instrument of judgment. And then secondly, let's notice the sovereign author of that judgment, and then thirdly, the saving purpose of this judgment. Tonight we have a word of God that speaks to us about a particular time and a particular people in a particular place. What I mean is that this text tells us about the sin of Judah and then the consequences that fell upon Judah because of that sin. And what we need to see is that although we cannot draw direct lines from this Word of God tonight to our lives or to the church today, what we learn from this text are important principles. And one of the important principles that this Word of God teaches us is sin has consequences. That's very clear from this Word of God before us tonight. Sin has consequences. Sin has eternal consequences. That's part of the message of this Word of God tonight. In all eternity, there are consequences for sin. But in time too, in this day, in the prophet's day, in this time of apostasy and sin, the people of Judah are about to learn they are not getting away with their sin. Their sin has consequences. And so, keep that in mind. We have to have our eyes open to that. This is the truth that we need to see applies today too. When things happen in the world that are unpleasant, when things happen within the church or within our own lives, we need to be sensitive to this. We need to be ready to see this. The Lord may be speaking to us about our sin. Sin has consequences. We see that as we examine this text beginning in verse 6. In verses 6 through 11. There, the consequence of the sin of Judah is that the Chaldeans are going to come and overrun the land. These Chaldeans are the people who live in the land east of the nation of Judah. And their capital city is the city 
of Babylon. And so for the sake of clarity, we can and will tonight refer to them as the Babylonians. And in verses 6 through 11, there is this terrible description of these Babylonians. And especially two things stand out. One is that this is a mighty nation. A mighty warrior nation with a mighty army against which no other army can stand. These Babylonians are described as bitter and hasty, that is, as fierce and forceful. They are fierce, mighty, and forceful. They go forth with one goal in mind, not to make peace, not to hammer out treaties, but to march into other lands to conquer them. No questions asked. What are we going to do? This is what we're going to do. We're going to go forth from our land and go into as many other lands as we can. Lands that we did not possess and possess them. They're terrible and dreadful, verse 7 says. A law unto themselves. That's how you have to understand that language. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. They do as they please. They have horses. And though they come from afar, they're a long way from the people of Judah at this time, God says, they will come swiftly. They will come with their horses more swiftly than leopards. And they will be fierce. They will devour as wolves in the evening. And they will descend as eagles upon their prey. And they will be powerful like the east wind. They will keep moving. They will establish a great empire over many people. How many people will these Babylonians rule over? As many people as the sand. That's what verse 9 says. And verse 10 says, they will laugh. They will laugh at the kings of Judah and other lands and their princes. And they will laugh at their fortified and defense cities. The city of Jerusalem with its walls and its towers, when they see that, they're not going to say, look at this impressive city on a hill, a city that cannot be taken. They will say, no problem. Let's heap up the dirt, make ramps, and send our hordes of soldiers over the walls to overtake the city. So that, first of all, this is a fierce, powerful people. Secondly, they will destroy Judah and Jerusalem. That's clear from the description throughout. That's clear especially from verse 9. They shall come all for violence. And verse 10 They will overcome the walls and the ramparts and the fortifications. They will come. They will laugh at the kings. They will remove kings. Take kings down and they will replace those kings with their own kings. And when they are finished with those kings as their puppets, they will say to the people of Judah, You have no king." No king, you are a vassal servant nation to us. And they will throw down the palaces, the walls, and the temple. And they will murder many people and bring the rest into captivity. It's hard for us to imagine what a burden this was for Habakkuk to hear that this was going to happen to his nation and to his people. We know nothing of war for the most part. There are soldiers in the military who fight wars, but we don't know what that's about. And we know nothing of what it means to be a part of a conquered nation and to be the prey of a mightier nation, 
that can do with us whatever it pleases. This is the word of God to Habakkuk and to the people of Judah. It's awful. But as we look at this, we need to see this as the consequence for sin. Jehovah God says there's going to be a national calamity. This is going to be a corporate judgment. A judgment not on an individual person or two, but on the whole nation of Judah. And this is judgment for the nation's sin. Now we know that. We know that. First of all, of course, from the connection between the previous verses and these verses. Where the prophet says, I see all of this iniquity in the land of Judah and I've cried out to God. And now God in response to that says, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be judgment. This is going to be the consequence for the sin of the people of Judah. But there's another important way that we need to see that in the text tonight. And that is in seeing a connection between the sin of the people of Judah in verses 2 through 4 and this judgment that falls upon them in the text. There were two main sins, remember, in Judah at this time. The first one was the violence against the neighbor. There was strife and division in the land. The unity of the body of Jesus Christ has been torn apart. The unity of the church. Instead of loving the neighbor, seeking to build the neighbor up, the people in the land were taking advantage of the neighbor. Spoiling, stealing, and through violence, hurting the neighbor. Well now, you notice, verse 9. These Chaldeans, they shall come all for violence. That's no coincidence. This is the just deserts of a violent people. This is the consequence for their sin of violence. You are a people who love violence. You are a people who love to take advantage of other people. Now you are going to experience this as a consequence for that sin. A mightier people, more powerful nation is going to come and they are going to commit violence against you. The second sin of the people of Judah was that they perverted justice. The law was slapped. Justice and judgment did not go forth. The righteous, when they went to their elders in the land, they received no help and support. And the wicked, when they were brought before the elders in the land, they received no discipline or correction. They were actually encouraged, pushed along in their wickedness and violence. Well now, verse 7 says, the Chaldeans are going to come and they will be a law to themselves. And what that means is that the Chaldeans are not going to come and overtake Judah and say, now we're going to establish Babylonian law here. And we're going to establish a new law and order in the land. No. When they were living in Babylon, these Babylonians probably submitted themselves to the laws of their land. But now they go forth as a mighty army saying, might makes right. And as an army that has conquered you, Jews, we may do with you whatever we want to do. Take your lands that didn't belong to us. Take you as our servants. Pillage, rape, murder. A people who didn't love justice will suffer under the injustice of a mightier nation. No, as I said, we cannot take this necessarily, this word, and apply it directly to any situation in our day and say, now this is what we will see happening. A heathen nation, another nation is going to overtake the church or overtake a particular de denomination and wreak havoc 
in that denomination. But rather, what we need to see in the first place is this principle, that sin has consequences. The Word of God is very clear on this here. If we have bought into the notion, like the people of Judah did, before these consequences came, that we can sin, because we are the people of God after all, we can sin without any consequence for our sin, this Word of God says sin has consequences. Not only that, the other principle here is the consequences are just. They fit the sin. The judgment is just and in harmony with the sin that is committed. And though we cannot stand here as prophets and predict what is going to happen in the future, in the world or in the church because of immorality and lawlessness, we are able. We are able to take this Word of God and we're able to see that this applies, aren't we? And then, and then we learn too not to think that those who are walking in sin and then who go more deeply into sin, that they are getting away with that sin. The fact is, that that is the judgment that has fallen upon them. When you look at a church that was like Judah in that day, and it turned away from God and His truth. People don't want the truth. And then that truth isn't found in that church anymore, and instead in that church are found false prophets and false teachers who bring not the Word of God that nourishes the soul, but who bring the people stones for bread. Understand, that's just judgment upon that church. And when churches turn away from the biblical standard of morality, and continue to go in the way of immorality more and more, and continue to claim the name of church and speak of Jesus Christ, don't think as you look upon that church, now there is a church of great sin that is getting away with its sin. But understand that as sin abounds, sin is punished with sin. That is a judgment, the consequence of sin. Isn't this what we see? The church says, we're going to approve of divorce for any reason. That's contrary to the Word of God. Don't think when you look in that church that no judgment, no consequences have come for that sinful decision. But understand, as you look at that church and you see divorce increase, the breakup of marriages and families, that's the consequence for that sin. The church won't say homosexuality is a sin. What's the judgment? This. The increase of that sin. And even more, immorality. This is true. This principle carries through also, although the focus of the text is on judgment upon Judah and the church, this is true also in the lives of individuals. We have to be sensitive to that. There are just consequences for sin. We see that in the life of David. David, who committed adultery, and the scriptures are quite clear in the fact that the just consequence for that sin was his son Absalom taking his concubines and committing adultery with them. And David, remember, committed murder. Murdered Uriah. And the just consequence of that was that his son, born of adultery, died too. And so, this is the warning of the text. This is the burden. This is the burden of the true prophet of God. The minister of the word as he stands before the congregation. The burden 
of elders as they labor with members of the church who have fallen into sin. Don't be insensitive. Don't think you can sin without consequences. Your sin will find you out. We are assured by this passage that our sins will find us out when we see that the sovereign author of every judgment is God Himself. We have to see the sovereignty of God here in the text. That's the second main element that is very clearly here in this Word of God before us. It is God who speaks in verse 5 and says, I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe though it be t told you. And for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. The people of Judah committed violence, so the judgment was that they would be subject to a nation that was violent. And that nation was the mere instrument of Jehovah God. A policeman may arrest a drunk driver, but that policeman is the instrument of God. And parents may discipline a child for disobedience, but that parent is an instrument in the hand of God. And the text is making it quite clear that it doesn't matter whether that instrument is conscious this, uh, of this or not. The people of Babylon would have been astonished by this. If they would have been told, if Nebuchadnezzar and the people of Babylon would have been told, you are the servants of God, you're merely doing what Jehovah God has commanded you to do, has planned for you to do, and is now making you do, they would have scoffed at that. It doesn't change the truth. God is the author of this judgment and every judgment. But the text teaches us that not only by showing us that God declares this, I do this, I am the one using the Babylonians as my instrument, but the text teaches us this by showing us that God is the sovereign ruler over history. Here, God speaks to the prophet of something that hasn't happened yet. And this is the main reason why this is an astonishing word of God, one that would have shocked the people. One that even if they had heard it from someone else, the people would have said, I don't believe that. That is not going to happen. The Chaldeans? Well, you have to understand that at this time in history, the Babylonians were a power, but they were a minor power. Within the sphere of the people of Judah, the mighty nation at this time was Egypt. And the mighty king was the man named Pharaoh Necho. And if the people had been told by someone, the nation that is going to overtake us is the nation of Egypt, the people might have said, well, that's possible. Although they were rather proud of the fact that they were the people of God and didn't think anyone could overtake them. But the Babylonians? Nebuchadnezzar at this time wasn't even king. He was merely a prince in Babylon. And the Babylonians didn't control much territory outside of their own immediate territory. This word of God is shocking in the same way that it would have been in 1950 or so if someone came along and said to the people of the United States, someday a man named Ronald Reagan is going to be the governor of California and then after that he's going to be the president of the United States. People would have said, Ronald Reagan? He's an actor. He's not even a politician. Surely, that's a mistake. Or you could bring that closer to our time. Think of 2002 or 2003 or 4. Somebody coming and saying, in 2008, 
the president is not going to be Hillary Clinton or John McCain or any other well-known politician. There's a senator in the state of Illinois that not many people know about, but in 2008, he is going to be the president, Barack Obama. Well, God didn't send a messenger to declare those things, but he could have. That's the, that's the meaning of the passage. God rules over nations. God rules over kings and rulers. God planned all things. He controls history. He sets up kings and brings them down. And the amazing thing that we can now look back from our point of view and see this word of God was fulfilled. Shortly after this, you have to understand in this history that the king of Egypt, Pharaoh Necho, he was so powerful at that time that Jehoiakim, who is the king of Judah now, was placed on the throne by him. He's the one who removed Josiah and put Jehoiakim on the throne. And there was a day shortly after this, when he said, I'm going to go out with my army and I'm going to establish my kingdom, make it stronger, even extend its borders. And he came to a place by the Euphrates River, Jeremiah 46 tells us, called Carchemish. And he met that prince of Babylon named Nebuchadnezzar and his army was defeated. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar's army was mightier than his army? No. No, we know, don't we? The ultimate reason was that this was the plan and the will of God. And then Nebuchadnezzar sent his army to Judah. And when King Jehoiakim rebelled against him, removed him from the throne, brought him into captivity in Babylon, and he began to reign oppressively over Judah. In 596 B.C. and then finally in 586 B.C. Doing all that God here in this word foretold. Destroying the temple. Raising the palaces. Keeping the walls of the city in rubble and burning the city to the ground and bringing the people that were not murdered into captivity. This was the work of God. The sovereign work of God. And this is the answer of God to the question of Habakkuk. Don't you see? Don't you care? Won't you judge? Won't you save? God's response is, I am the sovereign God of every nation, of every king, and of all of history. And that's why every sin has consequences. And no sin escapes judgment. Don't you see? Even if a sinner is able to say, I walk through life and I sin without any judgment or consequence, that sinner has not escaped the all-seeing eye of the sovereign God of heaven. He sees. And he judges. And He warns us. He warns us mainly through His Word. That's the warning we have tonight. God saying, you think you don't have any consequences for your sin? To anyone who is walking impenitently in sin, you think because no one else in the church, no one else in your family sees, God says, I see. I see. And he warns through His Word. And he warns through the office bearers when the sin is known. He warns through the other members of the church. That's the ordinary way that God warns. 
But God is able also, and that's the message of the text, He's able also to speak through the circumstances of life. If we are walking in sin, we won't heed the Word of God. We won't heed the admonitions of others. And don't you see, this is what the Word is saying. God is able to move heaven and earth. To do whatever is needed to be done. To bring consequences for you, for your sin. And when that happens, a judgment falls. Maybe it's a dreadful sickness. Maybe it is an enemy, heathen army, or heathen ruler God sends against the church. Maybe it's what you would call an accident or some tragedy in your family life. Do you see? Do you hear? That's the sovereign God of heaven speaking. And He's revealing that He's righteous and that He is no respecter of persons. God will remember Babylon's sin. That doesn't go unnoticed in verse 11. Then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend. That is, he shall offend God, imputing this his power unto his God, his idol. For his pride, Nebuchadnezzar and the nation of Babylon would fall in God's judgment to the Persians. But the people of Judah too, they find out that even though they are the children of Abraham, even though God has for many generations made covenant with them and dwelled with them in Judah, they find out that there's only one thing God says to an impenitent sinner, whether he be a Jew or a Gentile, whether he be an unsaved heathen or a lifelong member of the church member of the Protestant Reformed churches with believing parents and with believing friends, God says one thing to the impenitent sinner. There will be judgment. And at times, He sends this judgment in the world, in the church, in our lives. But ultimately, the judgment of God upon sin is eternal Eternal judgment. That's not what we have here in the text, but that's what the text is a precursor of. That's what the text is pointing to. The righteous God of heaven and earth who hates sin declares that He hates all sin, that He will judge sin eternally in hell. That's what Reverend Hawk spoke about last week. God will save His people. He will, and we're going to talk about that in the moment. But in the way of His people knowing how serious sin is. He judges all sin. And that, that is the burden. The warning of eternal, final judgment. That is the burden of those who are called by God to bring His Word to sinners. Not a pleasant word to bring. But it is the word that faithful elders bring to those who stray into the way of sin. You think your sin doesn't have consequences? You think because your life here on earth is easy and nothing seems to happen to you even though you're walking in your sin? Look up. See that there is a God in heaven. That He's a righteous judge. You perish in your sin. He will punish you forever. And the purpose of this is to save God. His purpose is to save His people. We can speak of a saving purpose here because we can look already here to the cross of Jesus Christ. We need to understand that what God is doing here, 
What God is doing here, what Habakkuk maybe doesn't see, is God is preparing things for what will happen 700 years later. He's preparing for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we look to the cross of Jesus Christ, we see judgment. We see God's judgment upon all of those who are not covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. But we see also God's judgment upon the sins of all His people. You think your sins don't have any consequences? This, this is the consequence. The sins of the people of God are what nailed Jesus to the cross so that He could pay for those sins. And we see in that too, don't we, how God was able and willing to move heaven and earth to save His people. In the Gospels, we find that God was willing and able to use the mightiest power at that time, the Roman Empire, to prepare everything for this death of Jesus Christ on the cross, to use that Roman governor Pilate to condemn Jesus to, the, to death, to send Him to the cross. There God's judgment fell to bring condemnation to the wicked and salvation for His elect. So that's what we see here in the passage. That's what we see here. What we see in the cross of Jesus Christ, God saving His people through judgment. It's what happened in Judah. What happened in this time when the carnal element in the church threatened to swallow up the people of of God so that the church would be destroyed. God had to send this judgment, this correction to destroy the wicked. Jehoiakim and the others in the nation who didn't know God and who would not repent of their sins. But to soften the hearts of His elect. To bring them to repentance so that they could return to the land of Babylon and be the people of God once Again, you see, although God never destroys His people, and Habakkuk recognizes that here in verse 12, he says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die. We can say that tonight too. We consider the judgments of God. He won't destroy us. Look to the cross of Jesus Christ. But even though that's true, sometimes, sometimes the people of God need correction. You see, we need to understand God does not save His people in the way of their walking impenitently in sin. No. God will powerfully turn His people from sin. He'll do that ordinarily by the preaching of the Word. He'll do that ordinarily in answer to their prayers. He'll do that through the admonitions of elders and of godly friends. But if He has to, He'll do that by sending judgment. By touching you. Bringing pain suffering to you. And if He does that, be patient. Be thankful. Don't complain. Don't complain. Don't complain when it's your parents' children who discipline you, who make you feel pain to correct you. Don't complain, congregation, when the elders come with a painful word and administer painful discipline, declaring to you a very sharp word that if you continue in sin, you have no place in the church or in the kingdom of God. They do that in love, to save your soul. That's what God does when He, through His providence, speaks to you in the circumstances of your lives. Bring some suffering, maybe for sin, to bring you to your senses, to save your soul. That's what God is always doing. Saving His church. 
Habakkuk prays to God about his times, about his city, his people. We need to see that God was not only working then, but before then, 700 years later in the cross of Jesus Christ, and now and always to save his people. You see, God used this judgment to spread the Jews throughout the land of Babylon and even throughout the world to bring with them their testimony. So that about 700 years later, there would be those wise men, those heathens from the east who would know and believe in Jesus Christ. And what God was doing here was not only building up His church and preserving and maintaining His church in Judah, but through this judgment, and this is astonishing, God was preparing to spread the gospel, salvation through Jesus Christ, to build up His church throughout all the world. Habakkuk didn't know that. But we can see it. God then and always saves His universal Catholic church. Through judgment. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy glorious Word. For the truth that reveals to us the seriousness of sin. Use Thy Word to turn us from sin. So that we do not need more severe correction. But if, O oh God, we prove to be stubborn and rebellious, continue to love us with such great love that Thou art willing to administer discipline and great sorrow and chastening to deliver us from our sin, to drive sin from our hearts, to bring us to the cross of Jesus Christ and salvation. And continue, Father, to bless us as a congregation, with faithful preaching, with faithful elders, so that we as a church may continue to walk humbly before Thee in the way of repentance. And deliver us, O God, from chastisement and judgment, we pray, that we might have peace with Thee, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.